you got a big job. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to start by talking about this big job. You, you've had, you've been at Facebook for a little while now. Coming in, you came in from Yahoo. What was your biggest priority coming in? So one of the interesting things about Facebook is in the last two years, the company has gone from focusing on the big blue app, right, Facebook.com and the, the mobile app, to doing all kinds of things for which there's no security playbook, right? So defining new kinds of human computer interaction via Oculus, building uh, the world's largest messaging platform with, with WhatsApp, uh, you know, the, all the interesting stuff that goes on in, in Instagram, uh, and now with internet.org, bringing internet access to the 60% of the world that doesn't have it. One of my biggest priorities is trying to expand the capabilities um, and the thought space of the security team so we can try to foresee the things that are gonna come out of those areas for which pretty much nobody's ever done ever in the world. So what's the, when you look at that, I mean, what is the biggest challenge in doing that? What are you telling the teams? You focus on this, you know, this is the, the, the priority of what you need to focus on. I mean, I, I think our biggest focus is safety in a world where with, when you have 1.5 billion users, you have a huge diversity of backgrounds and cultures and languages and levels of experience with the internet. And so trying to build products that uh, foresee issues that never occur to us sitting in our nice air-conditioned offices in Menlo Park, um, I think is the, the biggest challenge. Trying to get out of how we think the product should work and how it should be used to how it actually is being used in the field. You have this idea of safety versus security. Explain right. that. Yeah, so I, traditionally in the security world, we often think about our products as security is making sure our software runs as designed, right? Safety is making sure that products are safe as they're used in the real world, right? So like the best example is, you know, a car is not, is not supposed to be driven into a wall at 50 miles per hour, but if you happen to drive the car into a wall, that's been a foreseen circumstance and there are safety features there to keep you safe. But in security, traditionally, that kind of stuff, if, if somebody screws up and they give up their password or if they have an unpatched operating system, generally in the security world, we've wiped our hands and said, well, that's their fault, right? It's not a security problem. And the truth is, is, is safety is actually our responsibility, right? If, if a normal person can't use our products and keep safe, then that's on us. It's, even if they made a mistake, it's, it's not something that we can dismiss. So how do you get users to protect their data? I mean, how are you protecting it, but how do users protect their data? Because I don't know if users look at their Facebook data and think this is really, really valuable, like they would protect their bank account and take all these steps. Uh, but it is very valuable when you yeah. look at like, the rise of social engineering. You know, how do you tell users they need to protect their information? Something we're doing a lot of work in is can we present security choices in a way that's much more friendly. So there's this constant balancing act. If, if you try to provide lots and lots of choice, and Facebook's all about privacy choices, then you create complexity that confuses people. Um, and so, you know, something that a lot of people probably in this room have seen who have Facebook accounts is we're trying to rotate through pretty much everybody on the planet uh, every once in a while to, to prompt them, hey, it's time for a privacy checkup. Why don't you see what your page looks like if you're not a logged in user. Why don't you see what your page looks like to a friend versus somebody in this group? And then a security checkup. Here are a bunch of security features that you haven't turned on. We're gonna handhold you through it. Um, so I, I think we can't bury that stuff deep in the app anymore. We have to surface it and try to detect situations where somebody perhaps is not protecting themselves as best they can and in those cases push them into a flow um, where they're able to you know, affirmatively tell us what kind of security uh, features we, we should turn on for them. Who's attacking Facebook these days? Is it script kitties? Is it like nation states? I mean, wh yeah. what are you seeing? Well, who isn't, really? That's yeah. a, it's the fun part of the job is, is if there's an adversary on the planet, we've got it. Um, and so that is one of our challenges to think of security protections that work for everybody, right? So if, if you're just, a, you know, the vast majority of users, the 99% of the users, then, you know, automated account takeover because your password was stolen from a site and then is used to send spam or being defrauded by a link uh, or, you know, trying to get malware on your machine are kind of the standard day-to-day. -day. Uh, and then we also have to think about the 1% or probably less than 1% of users who have much more significant threat profiles, right? So journalists in war torn areas, democracy activists in countries that, where they're doing widespread internet monitoring. Um, those kinds of people, we also have to think about the threats, and obviously they're facing much more advanced adversaries, uh, and we have to give them the choices and then try to proactively protect them when we can. Facebook has just said that they're going to start notifying users if they believe, if you guys believe they're being spied on um, yeah. by a state sponsor, by a government. Um, 
which countries are you seeing are, are the worst <laughs> at spying? You know, I'm not going to talk about. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, the, the NRC. Even like the areas? <laughs> In the areas. Yeah. So, yes. So the continents where there are countries that do spying would be North America, South America, Europe, <laughs> Asia, <laughs> Australia. Oh, that way, that last one I'd be giving away. Um, look, I, the, the interesting thing is that you know, something that came out, I think, during the Arab Spring is that we traditionally in our field, we talk about like these really high-end countries that have lots of capabilities, right? The big, rich countries or the countries that spend a ton of money on their intelligence apparatus. Um, the truth is, is there are dozens and dozens of countries with some kind of capability in this area. Not all of it's homegrown. A lot of them go out and they buy commercial tools. Um, but uh, there's really, you know, we, we've seen all kinds of stuff in Sub-Saharan Africa, in the Middle East, in countries that you would never expect to have like a cyber warfare capability, have enough of a capability to attack individuals. Uh, and so that's kind of what we're aiming for with those warnings is we have always prompted people if we thought their accounts had been compromised, right? If it looked like your account had been taken over for spam, we'll send you through a flow to secure it. Or if we find out that your password is compromised somewhere else, we'll check that password against ours. And if we find it, we will walk you through a flow to fix it. That's kind of the highest end now of that series of warnings where if we see an attack that is very specific and that has the hallmarks of being nation state sponsored, we want those users to know it because those people should do a couple other things and just secure their Facebook account. They need to secure all their other accounts because generally if you're targeted by a government, that's a full spectrum targeting where they look at your entire online presence. They need to think about whether there's malware on their devices and then they might want to make decisions about their own physical safety like not traveling to certain places. Mm -hmm. um, and we thought it's, it's our responsibility to make sure to give people that information so they can make those choices. And you're, are you seeing more of those, those kind of, that kind of targeting? I, yes, I, we are definitely seeing more than ever before and I think that's only gonna get, as these capabilities become more and more commoditized, in the hands of more and more countries, we will continue to see it. When it comes to, to security, there's all this talk of biometrics and kind of the, the idea of passwords we think will be a thing of the past. When will passwords be a thing of the past for Facebook, or will they? Well, I, I mean, passwords have to go, right? Like, the password paradigm came out of uh, 70s multi-user mainframe systems. It makes no sense in 2015 when I'm carrying around a supercomputer with a secure element and a biometric chip um, the problem is, I mean, there's two problems. One, there's a coordination problem where things like biometrics and such, we need the entire industry to move to standards so that, uh, you know, we don't have to just assume that you have an $800 iPhone before providing it. Um, and then the second is that just like, you know, it used to be nobody got fired for buying IBM in, in the 70s. Nobody gets fired for using a password, right? Like, uh, but there's, passwords are well established and they're understood and the, the downsides are understood and kind of accepted by the industry, and as security, we're really not very good at experimenting and then letting people fail. And so we, we have, as an industry, to kind of move forward and be more mature about allowing people to try new authentication technologies to maybe make mistakes and then to move on without it being a humongous scandal. Which one do you think is kind of the most promising? It, you know, it's interesting, because the funny thing is authentication is easy. What's hard is account lifecycle management, right? And that's the problem people don't really think about is you have to, any of the companies in here and us at, a, at probably a larger scale have to think about all of the different scenarios that reasonably can happen. I could lose my phone. I can lose my phone and my computer at the same time. I can have my phone number rotated. Or in some countries, people don't have carriers. They just go buy a different SIM every 30 days, right? And, and providing a lifecycle management where you can reset your account get control back of your account, that's actually the hard part. Um, the, the authentication itself isn't that big of a deal. Um, these days where everyone's kind of getting hacked, you have a lot of folks, maybe even the audience, who are building out these companies at an early stage, might be handling sensitive data. What advice do you give companies that aren't, don't have Facebook's infrastructure, don't have the money behind it? Yeah. Uh, what advice do you give them to, to say, if you do this, you will be much better off, you will keep data safe, and, and you might not be unhackable, but you'll have a better shot at it. Right, so um, my biggest advice for startups would be, you know, try to utilize what other people have done before you in as many situations as possible, both to accelerate your development and from a security perspective, right? So, you know, all of you guys have special snowflake companies that are so incredibly unique and nobody's doing the same thing, but the, the truth is your security flaws are the same, right? The kind of security risks you face are the same. And so whenever possible, you should never run your own IT infrastructure. Nobody in the room is really qualified to run an exchange server 
with any kind of real adversary. You should be using an outsourced Office 365 or Google Apps or some off outsourced service. Run on the cloud as high as possible. If you can do platform as a service, that's great. If not, if you have to have your own operating systems, that is like a huge step change in the amount of risk you have to maintain your own OSs. Um, so as, as much as possible, if you're going to do that, make sure they're stateless as much as possible and use things like OS Query, which is an open source tool we provide to look for, for threats. Um, try to use people's standard frameworks using React um, and various web frameworks. And a lot of those things have automatic magical protections for things like cross-site scripting and SQL injection. Um, so the less you build yourself, the less likely it is you're going to introduce a security flaw that's specific to you. Where are you guys most at risk at Facebook? Where are we most at risk? I, like when you're going to bed and you're tired and you're, but you can't go to sleep because you're freaking out over <laughs> one thing. What is it? Somebody just I know, I think someone just said something. What, what would you say it is? Um, I, probably, I, the biggest risk for us is that, is for us missing something that is a very specific issue that is being faced by a small number of people, right? Like that's what worries me the most is that we'll have situations that I feel like we didn't, move quick enough where you have a population that's at risk because they're being targeted by a specific attacker um, or because of some kind of societal or cultural or language issue that we didn't understand. Um, and so I think the biggest risk for us is just from a footprint perspective, trying to keep people safe, which is, you know, again, different than secure, trying to keep them safe when we, we don't understand um, the background of all these people is, is a huge challenge and will constantly be a challenge. There's like, unlike some of these other security issues that we can maybe solve and then move on, like we'll never be done with that. We'll never be done with, you know, that's only gonna get harder as the next 60% of the world gets online. Talk about how you're, you and other tech companies are kind of sharing information to prevent attacks. Yeah, so one of the um, big changes in the last couple of years is that companies are doing a much better job of getting together to stop attacks once and then make sure it stops everywhere. So we operate a service called Threat Exchange, which is a, a free and will always be free platform for real-time machine-to-machine threat sharing. So how that works is, for example, let's say somebody sends a Word document uh, as an attachment to Messenger or links to it uh, in a Facebook post. We'll grab that file, do a bunch of automated analysis. Let's say we find malware that has never been seen before. We will upload that to Threat Exchange and all of a sudden, all of the other companies that participate will block that malware. And the goal here is that uh, various attackers on the high end especially will have dedicated R&D teams that will spend you know, man months or years building an exploit or building malware, and we want to punish them for trying to use it on one of the threat exchange members. And so we have 130 companies, we have 10,000 applications. It's not a paid service, so I don't have a bunch of salespeople to handle the paperwork, so we're actually, um, expanding our capability to onboard people more quickly. Uh, but we're hoping to build kind of the standard threat sharing platform with all the pr privacy protections that allow you to share with only one or two companies or to share with much larger groups. And let's look at the, the idea of harassment. We look at Gamergate um, and, and you just see how harassment is so prevalent on social yeah. networks, on Twitter, Facebook. What are you guys doing to, I mean, do you have an algorithm that picks up some of this stuff? What are you guys doing to, to help uh, prevent harassment and what could you be doing a little bit better? Yeah, I, I mean, one of the real sad features of the world we're living in now um, is that it is way too easy to be scared off the internet for your voice to be silenced uh, because there's people out there who are willing to uh, dox you uh, or call you names or to, to send you death threats. Um, I mean, it's a challenge for Facebook. I would say some other platforms have more of a challenge because of their models allowing for an infinite number of pseudo-anonymous accounts, right? So we, don't ha we have less of a sock puppet issue. It is, we can make it hard to create 30 or 40 Facebook accounts and then use, have one account for legitimate discussion and 39 people that then harass anybody who disagrees with you. I'm not gonna call out any companies where people can assume uh, which ones have that problem. Um, you're right, I mean, from an algorithm perspective, whenever you have 1.5 billion people and thousands of employees, uh, you have to do most things from an automated perspective. And so we have a very tight loop between the content, uh, the community operations people who enforce our community policies, and then turning that into code, Haskell code, actually, for if there's any functional programming fans out in the audience, uh, turning that into the Haskell code that then looks at all of the content on Facebook, and then trying to find new patterns. And unfortunately, there's an infinite amount of variety in the kind of ways people will harass each other, but we're 
we're doing, I think, an okay job. We can always do better at figuring out what those patterns are, putting into the computers so that we automatically scrub most of it, and then trying to react as quickly as possible uh, when people aren't. But again, you know, we will kick people off if they reach a certain level of harassment. Um, and then that is a death penalty, and it is much harder to create than a trustworthy account on Facebook. And our hope is, you know, we'll continue to, to win against that. When you look at what's happened with the NSA and, and big tech companies, um, there's this kind of ongoing debate as to oversight, how much, you know, how much oversight should the NSA have, how much access to our data, how much should Facebook share. Um, where do you fall? I mean, how much access uh, should the government be, government be able to have to our data? So, yeah, this is a kind of a hot topic. Um, just to be clear, there are no secret backdoors. Facebook does not give backdoor access to any government anywhere in the world. There are legal mechanisms by which com countries can request data from us, and those legal mechanisms are documented in our transparency report. The, the latest one is gonna be coming out any day now, so you guys can see what the trends are there. Um, my, my job is to make sure that our users' data is safe in as many ways as possible, and that if any government wants access to data, they have to come to us, right? Um, that they have to come through the front door and they have to have legal response uh, you know, we, we have had some reform in the U.S. I, you know, we continue to push for certain things. I, I think right now my biggest focus is on uh, making sure that the numbers in that transparency report are accurate and that that's the only way any government anywhere in the world can get to user data. You've been in this for so long. You've been in the security world for a you long time. You just say I'm old, Lori. You're not that's old. That's fine. You're not You've been old. in this so long. <laughs> You've been you look really tired. This in your you have first a tough rodeo. job. <laughs> um, you, what is like the craziest, the worst hack, the worst attack you've seen? The worst I've seen? Yeah, what is the worst? I, I think one of the more interesting widespread ones was the 2009 Aurora attacks, right? Mm -hmm. Which was, um, a lot has changed since then in the ability of an attacker uh, to, to hit many, many companies at once. But the fact that 35 major, major companies uh, were all owned up by the same piece of malware, I think was a real sea change moment, and that's why we are where we are with things like OS Query and Threat Exchange, where we're trying to make it much more difficult for those attackers, one, to get in, but also not allowing them to attack 30, 40 companies at once and to amortize the cost of their command and control systems and their operational systems and their malware across a, a huge operation. Where are we most vulnerable now? Where are we most vulnerable? I, you know, I mean, one of my biggest concerns these days is mobile devices, right? So there's you know, Android has been a huge success and that has created a huge amount of creativity in the creation of smartphones, but it also means that there are hundreds of millions of Android devices that will never be patched and that are vulnerable to very easy to exploit bugs. Um, and so that's one of the things I worry about, one of the things we have to focus better on as an industry is we're trying to make it so that if your phone is unpatched and you get malware, that that doesn't mean it's automatically game over, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that all of your data is automatically stolen uh, that we can try to detect that and, and uh, interfere before they get full access to your account. Um, but I think that's like, you know, the unpatched mobile devices is probably the number one interesting threat that's facing individuals now. Um, and I know we got to wrap, but what, what were you like as a kid? Were you just breaking things? Were you hacking kind of illegally? What, what yeah, I mean, I was just as nerdy but shorter. Um, I'm Greek, so I had about the same amount of facial hair uh, <laughs> when I was 13. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I started in this from the security research, and you know, I got a Commodore 64 uh, when I was seven or eight, uh, and a 300 baud modem, uh, which for you kids, that's a modem that's so slow that you can type faster than it. So you'd actually have to type and then wait for the buffer, and then you could go back. Uh, and so having fun on BBSs and doing other things for which the statute of limitations has now expired. Um, is how I got into this industry and a lot of people in security. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think it's the most fun part of computer science, right? Like, every part of computers magically gets better every year. Like, hard drives get bigger and computers get faster, so you don't even have to write good code because, you know, don't worry, Moore's Law will take care of it. But security gets harder every year, right? And it's because systems get more complex and the number of people affected gets larger and the impact of what we do gets much bigger. Like, even 10 years ago, Hacking online was kind of this cute, like, fun game, and now it's a literal life and death, uh, life and death issue for a lot of people. Um, and so, you know, I mean, while a lot of us got into it from the fun side, I think growing up, it, we see it serious, and I think it's a great field for. I like, I like to go talk at colleges and tell people to get into it uh, because it's it's also something that will never 
uh, never be solved, so you have long-term job security. Wonderful. Great. Well, there it is. Thank you so cool. much. Thanks, Lord. <laughs>